My name is Kelly, and today we're going to talk about phase two, the fact phase, and phase three, the thought phase. The fact phase is everybody in the critical incident stress debriefing will go around and say what their role was, what their first thoughts were, and what they did. We just want to find the pieces of this puzzle and kind of put them together so the dispatcher can know what the cop did, the cop can know what the fireman did, and they can all see the incident from a different point of view. Phase three is the thought phase, and everybody can talk a little bit about what it was like when they go off autopilot. With first responders, we tend to put everything emotionally in the back and get our jobs done. And then when we finally get off autopilot, a few hours or a day or so later, we really start thinking about the incident. And that's the part we wanna discuss in the thought phase. It gets to go from a little bit of the cognitive into the more emotional phases of the critical incident stress debriefing. So the next one, like I said, we don't have to go around in a circle anymore. Everybody understands when we go, we, we rely on our training and experience. Uh, we go into our autopilot mode and we just kind of go to doing our job. Um, so once you got there and you realized, uh, once you came off autopilot, what was the first thing you thought about? What was your first, uh, what was the first thing you thought about when you, when you came out of that mode? Well, I know that one of the one of the first thoughts that I that I had was um, uh, was uh, about our equipment. Um, we were uh, helping assisting the truck with the extrication of the uh, 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 of the driver, and uh, we had checked the equipment earlier and still couldn't figure out why it didn't operate. But when we got there, it just it wouldn't work. And you know, I, I know I had checked my part on it, but that that it was that first thought of of you know there, our equipment's not working. We need to get this this uh, gentleman out of the vehicle, and yeah, it's just extremely frustrating. I, I I can't even explain how upset I was at that. So, I uh, you know I I no. was responsible for a portion of it. I know Amanda was supposed to check uh, uh, her portion of it as well. And you know, I made sure that the the generator was working, the the hoses were were intact. You know, I I double checked all of that in for all of that part of it. So, like we kind of touched on in the beginning, this isn't an operational critique of the event. This is just to identify um, the incident and how it affected you and your reactions to it, and try and help each one of you go through that. Operational debriefs. Uh, will be handled by your your own agency um, in your own departments uh, within their time, but uh, this isn't the place for for trying to find those things out. So if we had better traffic control, my partner wouldn't have had a, her leg severed. I mean, that's just I don't know. Sometimes it's just you see. Yeah, sometimes you think it's a critique now, but now you got. I mean, it's just it should have been me that hit, got hit, and got my leg cut off because. I mean, she's got a family, and it's just, yeah, there should have been better traffic control. That trooper should have done his job better. I'm so sorry things, for so, your loss. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Things would be different if things were done right. So it's Charlie, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was your partner that got her leg cut off? Yeah, I mean, it's, you have your, you come on a scene, uh, when I got there, this one, uh, the older guy that's got in vehicle two, he was uh, walking around days, just confused, he shouldn't be driving in the first place, but DV kept on getting uh, these old farts their job, they're, they're licensed so they can keep them on the road, but anyways, that's not the point. Come back, because uh, the traffic wasn't, was still going back and forth, and, had, and uh, this drunk guy swerved and hit my partner. And I just sort of been in better control in the situation. Trooper was there, he should have done his job better. Okay. So some of these phases that we'll talk about will kind of bleed into each other um, because we do, uh, it, it's just who we are. We talk about how we feel about something, how we reacted to something. Um, so s some of it might sound repetitive. So uh, I, I just want to kind of give you a heads up on that because that's, it's just the nature of how this works. Um, so. Thank you for sharing that, Charlie. Um, and I, I can't explain uh, how I feel about, you know, what happened to your partner. So that's got to be a really hard thing. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, who else would like to share their first thoughts once they came off autopilot? Well, about this, I just think you, you say that it can't be operational. 
um, but isn't. We might not be sitting here right now if it wasn't for some of those failures. Okay. And so, you know, he lost his partner. We had traffic, uh, traffic control, which is an issue. Um, there was better safety. Um, knowing that the weather was in a bad place, you, you might have had to make some adjustments. She might have not lost her, her leg. And, you know, we've been complaining about that equipment for, for months now about, okay. you know, the doors not working. And then we were worried about, you know, we haven't tested the Jaws of Life on, um, we just were assured that they'd work when they did. And, and we probably lost the life because, but it took 30 minutes. It shouldn't have took 30 minutes. Um, we probably wouldn't be sitting here um, talking about it. So that's why I don't understand why we can't talk about operations. And I, I, I hear uh, that that's a big issue. And I truly hope that your agency does the operational debrief with you. Um, I would assume they would, my agency would. Um, but, and, and I've been in those situations where your equipment doesn't work. We all work for a government agency and every single one of them has equipment that doesn't work. And that's the purpose of those operational debriefs. Um, sometimes, and what this helps, helps accomplish is seeing somebody else's perspective. We sit in a circle and if you look straight ahead, each one of us has a different perspective of our circle. I'm seeing this guy right here. She, or this gentleman is seeing, or Robbie's seeing the wall behind me. There's, there's different perspectives that each one of us have. And the goal of this and the hope of this is to hope that each one of you sees that different perspective and it kind of helps answer that question of, oh, okay, well, well, maybe this could have happened this way, but this is why it happened this way. And each one of you did the best job that you could have done in the situation that you were given. Not that trooper. And I, and I get that, that it's a perspective, but um, we're not talking about perspective. We're talking about equipment working and equipment not working. It's David, right? Matt, I'm sorry. You're David. Yeah. Um, at the end of this, we're going to talk about some possible good outcomes and things we can make some productive changes. So we can bring that up then and then we can work together as a group to make those good changes. But it's my understanding is fire, because I used to do some fire work. Um, equipment's checked every morning, correct? And signed off and all of that? Right. Yeah, maybe if we had some accountability, like, you know, actually set up uh, a checklist and, and the firefighter had to sign off on things they checked so that we could better point at, you know, who did, uh, who didn't, better yet, who didn't do what they were supposed to do. Because, you know, we were there for half an hour trying to pull that guy out and that that put your partner out on the out on the road for that much longer. And that's just ridiculous. It's just people just not doing their job. It all boils down to it. I mean, it's just people just not doing their job. I mean, it's it's that easy. Just do your job. Be professional. I mean, we're professionals here. If you can't sit there to that standard, we need to expect of ourselves. How can other people expect it from us? And have functional equipment. <laughs> So, Charlie, I want you to remember that you you are a professional, and and honestly, guys and gals, let's let's stay that way. This is this is not a blame game right here. This is we're here to get through a traumatic event that we that you've all experienced. Okay, Charlie. One of the things that you said was that the driver that hit your partner was drunk. That puts it back on that driver. Okay. We can we can't you know this is again this is not a blame game and we can talk about this after this whole event's over, but I I would really like to talk to you more about that. But let's blame it on that driver, and not that trooper. Let let's think about that and, and let's think about the equipment and and you guys have been partners for years on this on this team, and you guys work together. So yes, you check it every morning and you trust each other with each other's lives. And we're not blaming each other. We all know our cell phones don't work. The stereo in your car doesn't work. The windshield wiper doesn't work. Mechanical things fail. Everybody that's in this line of work knows who Murphy is. It never fails. So don't blame your partners right now. Let's talk about this event. Let's talk about what happened at this event. What brought all of us together at that event and caused us to be here. It was a traumatic event that we're all involved in. And so let's talk about putting this puzzle together and figuring out what everybody did and what your thoughts were right now or at that time when you got on scene and what you observed, all right? Let, let's try to go that route right now.
All right, is that fair enough? So this is what I saw when I first got there. He had uh, an elderly man, the guy in the vehicle, in the second vehicle, was walking around dazed. Why wasn't he set aside or controlled? Trooper was there already there, setting up traffic, trying to divert uh, traffic to keep it from being getting worse. Uh, I got there, put my put him in there, tried to help him with the traffic control. And then my partner got there, and my partner got there. She gets out, and then here comes a drunk driver that wasn't controlled. Ended up swerving her and had taken her uh, taken her out and had her uh, severed leg. We're still waiting on Hell Flight to get there. Uh, we're still waiting on the ambulance to get there. We're still waiting on people to do their job, and it's just uh, it's frustrating. It's very frustrating when you expect a certain from your professional coworkers to be there at time, and you don't get it. Uh, it's frustrating. That's what I feel. I feel mad. I feel upset. I feel I should have wanted to have been hit by the by that car, not my partner. I just and those those feelings are all normal, Charlie. You're you're definitely entitled to have those feelings, and we'll get through those. Okay, I promise you. It just feels like timing is everything. I mean, that, that roll-up door, what, how can that not be working? How is that not operational? I mean, that killed five minutes. Five minutes is huge. Maybe that lady doesn't die, we get there in time. Maybe we get the traffic set up and his partner doesn't get hit like that. It just, I mean, you talked about the first thing we thought of when we got off autopilot. I couldn't stop thinking about that door. Why, I mean, it's a silly little door. Just don't know why it wasn't working. Thank you for checking Got off I know that while I was waiting for them to get the, the driver and the kid out of the car, I had plenty of time to think about how helpless I felt because I couldn't do anything to save them. You know, like I, there was, I had, there, I couldn't get in the car. You know, I, I couldn't even do C-spine. There was nothing I could do. And I just had to wait. That's, that's kind of how I felt, too. Um, I wasn't on scene, but I was getting phone calls from multiple people. Um, obviously, they're terrified and they're horrified by what they've seen. And, um, you know, Weathers holding up the hell of flight. And, and I'm just sitting there, you know, wishing that I could do more to get the resources out on the scene. Um, and, and, and it just seems like, you know, everything went wrong that could go wrong. Well, I'll never forget the face of that little boy. I'll, I'll tell you that. I can't. Oh, I can't forget. <laughs> the way he looked at me when I pulled him out of the car. And Thank you. Yeah. Um, that, you know, he's not going to see his mom tomorrow. You know, he's not going to wake up and see her. And the, the husband... Um, just was, I mean, you could not, con obviously you could you not console him. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just, I just feel for that little boy and what, what he's going to go through in his life without her. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, that's a hard thing to, to share. I'm just confused on how we always have our procedures that we go by. There should be no question on how things fall into place. And when I came onto site and there's people running to the, the car with losing the mother and then going, running to the elderly man that's walking around. And then, so I call Hello Flight for the elderly man. And then the officer gets hit. And then we have to change that to high priority for him and then go to a medic to call for backup. And just one thing after it's another ridiculous. just kept falling it's apart. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It was... <sighs> But just remember, you had a lot of circumstances going on. You had a narrow interstate, in my understanding. You, you know, had a uh, bad, bad weather. The helicop helicopter was initially dispatched, but then, but then couldn't go because of weather, Blink just twice. for yeah. safety. Yeah. But then um, you guys were still able to get equipment working. You were able to get them out of the cars. You know, I know that you're frustrated, and I understand that's normal. 
and it's just, it just really angers me on the lives and the families is just getting, this is not what we do. Did you think about the fact though, and, and you too, and all of you guys so far that, yes, the mom was deceased, but you got the son and the dad out and you've given them back each other. And even though you felt helpless on scene, you were still there. You were a face that gave them hope. I bet if you could talk to them at some point when this is all settled and done and they're out of the hospital, that they would tell you how much they appreciated you being there amongst that chaos. Because although it was a difficult scene with things that happened, it could have been much, much worse, right? You could have maybe not got out of the station at all, right? The helicopter could have maybe not got there at all, right? Your partner could have maybe been injured, come, you know, much worse. So try to think of it that way as well. You gave that family and even that little old man that was driving the other vehicle, right, some direction and hope. And we'll, and we'll talk a little bit later about the feelings that you guys are going through, but the feelings of, of helplessness and, and anger, those are all normal. There's, there's I, I wish I could say there, there was a, a, a normal feeling to this, but each one of us is gonna have a different feeling to it, a different reaction to it. Um, so everything that you guys are feeling is normal for you. And I just want, I, I want to reiterate that. We're going to, we'll, we'll probably say that more times throughout. Um, but it's very important for you guys to hear that the, the way you guys are feeling right now um, is very normal. Okay. I don't know if I want this to be normal. I looked at that five-year-old boy watching a five-year-old process the death of his mom. That's not normal. I don't know how many times I can go through watching something like that happen. I don't want that to become normal. Okay. It's normal for me now is uh, <sighs> nightly, uh, just the nightmares. I just, um, I can't, I can't sleep. I can't lay down and just not see what I saw. Um, I can't stop thinking about it. It's just, it's keeping me up. I'm stressing out. I just, I'm angry. I'm really angry. Mm -hmm. This, this isn't fair for the, I mean, yeah, we helped a family, but that little boy's life is never gonna be the same again. And I don't think I'm ever gonna be the same again, to be, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I. I don't see how this is going to end for me. Okay. So that's what this process is for: is to help you see that and kind of get through that. Um, and and it's not it's not even getting through it; it's being able to move with that new, because it's you're not going to forget about it. Um, you might think about this sometime down the road, twenty years down the road, at the end. Uh, you know, whenever you finish your career, you might think about it then. But it's moving on with that new what happened um that and this is hopefully once all this is done and the process works through you'll be able to see that your peers can help you through this um and some of the reactions and stuff like that and some of the uh, and some of the services that can be available if some of these thoughts and 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 feelings prolong beyond this Okay. This process isn't to help anybody forget about what happened. As you said, you're not, you'll never forget that, right? But this is to help you get through the process, to help you uh, understand the way you're thinking and the way you're feeling and try and help you so you can sleep at night. Uh, I'm sure you're not the only one, you know. Um, I mean, it's, it's tough. A lot of people will never see anything or experience anything that you guys uh, went through in their whole life. So that that's the whole reason for this. And um, we, we want you to, we want you to talk about the way you feel and what, and what happened. Does anybody else have uh, anything else uh, about um, coming off of autopilot? Your, your first thoughts when you... I went straight to thinking that um, 
I could never do this. Because you guys know me. I'm a perfectionist. I do this to a T. And I'm taking full responsibility because the jazz of life did not work. And I can't wrap my mind around the fact that I'm the person who prevented a happy ending to this. And my eight-year-old nephew looks up to me and he wants to be in this position that I'm in. And now I'm considering, is it worth going into this position when I have failed in the most extreme manner? And I, I can't move past that. I can't move past something that my career depends on. And I, I just can't. Um, I don't understand how that can be moved past. So again, hopefully we'll be able to help you with understanding how you can move with that. Um, like Robbie said, Murphy's there. And our guidelines and everything that we go by with our job, that's exactly what they are, they're guidelines. They can't answer every single thing that's gonna happen to us in the field. Um, you can do everything you want, everything could have checked out perfect that morning. And when you get on, on scene, it's still gonna break. And that's out of your control. You don't have any control over that. You did your job to the best of your ability. Every person in here did your job to the best of your ability. So hopefully we can help you uh, move on with that and understand that you can still, you did your job and that you will still have a full career. Your, your eight-year-old nephew will still look up to you as a hero and those moments will be there. Okay? But as an operator, um, you talk about the new normal. And my first thought is if the new normal is going out to a scene, you know, just hoping and praying that, that uh, the equipment works. I don't know if I want to be part of the new normal. Uh, I had confidence in it. It has worked in the past, but we've made, we've made uh, several complaints and the proper chain of command um, is about the equipment from the garage door um, to just being told that we have the finest equipment. I don't know if it's uh, budget issues or whatever it is, but um, when we're in the life-saving business, we've got to be able to count on that equipment. I know you have variables. Um, you know, it drives me crazy, the weather. Um, but, you know, that's not an excuse. We need to be prepared for the weather. Um, we need to have plans in place, and we need equipment that works. So I, I'm, I'm sorry to keep bringing this up, but... It's Matt, right? So, so Matt, um, like Sergeant Seeley said, is that after this is all over, we're, we're going to try to come up with some good ideas for your department. That and and what we one of the things we do is we reach out and we we discuss things like that and make suggestions to things like that. And it sounds like you know just having a spare uh, jaws of life on the truck might be the solution to that. And then that's something that you know if. if when we get to that after this is over, you can share that with us and, and you're sharing it now and, and tell us what what kind of suggestions might be made. And, and those are things, and it doesn't mean that they're going to get fixed. We all work for the government and we all know that most of the time it's the lowest bidder. We know that. Everybody that works for a government agency knows that that's how it is. And so we can just make the best suggestions that we can. And I, I un absolutely understand your frustration with not having the proper equipment. And, and we're going to address, help you address that and, and, and try to make things better. But um, we want to help you get through this process. And so the new norm is the next time I go out, I trust that my partners that I work with checked it. And I trust that it's going to, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm trusting that it's going to work. And that's all we can do until we are able to get that other piece of equipment to make sure that works. You know, or we come up with another solution, but we can we can definitely come. figure it out. I hope those changes come. I just, you know, too bad we had to lose a life to maybe motivate to get some of that stuff taken care of. That's definitely unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Did you want to share your first? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and, you know, I'm good at what I do, and my crew's good. I ensure that. I hold them to a high level, high standard, and... You know, when something operationally doesn't go well, I get angry because I don't think it 
needs to be this way if we train properly or have resources and everything that we need. I hear what you guys are saying. You know, we need to put that past it. That anger is not going to go away anytime soon, and I still feel it today. But when I got off that all apart, all I can think about, my thought was the mom is deceased. He's the same, she's the same age as my wife. And I've seen death before. Um, this was a woman with a son who's injured also, and that son is five years old, and I have a five-year-old boy. Um, and I just, I see my family, I see them in that car, in that accident. And uh, it's kind of consumed me. You know, I, I, I don't want my family driving anywhere. You know, if they need something, I go get it. Uh, but I don't even like being at home, you know, because they were, when I see my wife and my boy, I, I see, I immediately go to what she looked like, you know. I can't, the vision, I can't get it I, I don't go home straight after work. I meet up with the guys, we go have a couple of drinks, you know. Okay. That was my initial thought. Sometimes that can make it harder when we make those associations, when things like that are so similar and, and close to us. Um, and it can make it harder sometimes to, to be able to process that when you see it all the time. And that kind of uh, leads into our next uh, phase, uh, which is the reaction phase. And it's what your reaction to it was. What was the worst part of this for you? 